Welcome to Strictly Facts, a guide to Caribbean history and culture, hosted by me, Alexandria Miller. Strictly Facts teaches the history, politics, and activism of the Caribbean and connects these themes to contemporary music and popular culture. Wagwan family, welcome back to another episode of Strictly Facts, everyone's favorite guide to Caribbean history and culture. When we think of the Caribbean, it's sometimes impossible to name all of the islands. Of course, there are so many, big and small. They can range from region. We can complicate it thinking of, you know, islands like Corn Island that we talked about a number of episodes ago that are technically in South America or Central America, but they're, due to our history of colonialism, very much so part of the Caribbean. And so another aspect that I think we often don't talk about for our region and obviously most of the world is how often do we all think of the Dutch Caribbean islands? How often do they come to mind? So they're made up of the constituent nations, Aruba, Curacao, St. Martin, and territories, Bonaire, Saba, and St. Eustatius. And obviously to, you know, further add to this long history of Dutch colonialism, you have to obviously include Suriname, formerly Dutch Guiana until it officially became independent in 1975. So the Dutch Caribbean is obviously an equally important part of our community um, and our ever-growing diaspora as well. So joining Strictly Facts for this episode, we have Dr. Margot Groundwoud, social historian and senior lecturer at the University of Curacao. Dr. Groundwoud, thank you so much for joining us today. Please tell us a bit about yourself. Um, where in the Caribbean is near to you, and how you got interested in doing Dutch Caribbean history. Yes, thank you for having me once again, Alexandria, and I'm very happy to be talking about the Dutch Caribbean. A very long time ago, when I was doing my master's, I chose Suriname history as topic for master research. So I've been interested in the Dutch Caribbean for a very long time, even when I never visited there. I was born and raised in the Netherlands, and I did my master's in Leiden. For my master's research, I went to London and Oxford to do research. So Suriname at first, uh, but then long after that, I moved to Curaçao for personal reasons, and I got a job at the university here of Curaçao as the head librarian. And in that function, I sort of rekindled my interest in being a historian and doing the work of a historian. And that was the perfect uh, moment for me and the perfect environment not only from a a professional background, but also because I had so, so, so many questions. There were so many things that I I didn't understand that I saw around me. So that's when I moved back to being an academic after, well, more than 15 years. And I did my PhD and uh, I wrote a lot of articles and I cannot imagine having had a life not being in academia before, so it's still very important of all the opportunities that I have in studying uh, the Caribbean. So that's a sort of a personal introduction about going back and from study field. Of course, when I started doing my research, living in Curaçao, having all these questions about Curaçao society, and in particular about the role of religion of the Catholic Church in this Protestant environment, from a historical point of view, the Dutch, the Netherlands are, are a Protestant country. So I mean, there were so many questions about the colonialism, colonial system. So I got immersed in, in that part of our history. Jumping directly into our discussion today, though, one thing I definitely want to ask you are what are some of the reasons you find the Dutch Caribbean being sort of neglected in broader discussions about the Caribbean? Well, first of all, This is a neglect that you see in general in Caribbean studies. It's called an afterthought, the Dutch Caribbean as afterthought. And you can see that quite physically when you open the book. Then there's this last paragraph, this aha. But the thing is, there's much more behind that. Which I find fascinating is the fact that it's not just something that the outer world does to us. It's something in the relationship with the the Netherlands as well. And it's within society also, Um, but of course in in different uh, manifestations. And what I mean by that, to make it more concrete, more specific, first, if I look at the Netherlands and academia in the Netherlands, 
because our universities are too small to have all these disciplines. We don't have a history department or anything. But in the Netherlands, we do. And what you see there is also that colonial history, as it used to be named, I don't know the exact wording now, but sometimes it's expansion history or whatever. It's like this separate sort of side dish, back garden type of research. And especially, this is a very new thing for the Netherlands, the whole awakening to post-colonialism. You may have, have heard about the blackface discussion in the Netherlands. Perhaps you know the publication by Professor Gloria Becker, White Innocence. And the Dutch have had quite a late awakening to their own racism. And in that discussion, things are moving now more towards inclusivity uh, on all fronts. It's the same with LGBTI representation, inclusive language. There's this movement, there's this acceptance, there's perhaps an overreaction now to compensate for the you know, the late awakening, as I, I like to call it. So if there is neglect, it doesn't suffice to just be the victim of that neglect. It's part of, of the system there. And what I did in my in the publication, I think you mentioned the small acts, uh, the March 2021 20, edition, is that I took this sort of phenomena of, of being neglected as part of Caribbean intellectual history. And I did not write the article to explain or to understand the neglect as a whole better, but I looked specifically at one period in our history, and that's the period of decolonization. So from the 30s to the early 60s, because that's when we in the Caribbean had all these opportunities to make shift both in our own paradigms, in our self-image, in our being connected to the wider Caribbean. And I wondered, what did we do with these opportunities? Because in today's Dutch Caribbean, as I know it, the Caribbean is very often seen as, in a way, inferior to us. I'm sorry to put it that way, but our students never consider going to University of the West Indies, for instance, uh, let alone their parents. Me, coming from Europe, I always wondered, why would you go to the University of Curaçao when you don't go to Trinidad? And that says very much about my own background as well, of course. I went to study in Leiden and I had the opportunity to move out of my family home, not because I didn't want to be with my family, but it was just the excitement of being in a new environment, etc. And you didn't see these movements. You don't see them, even the participation in Carib Festa or things like that. There's a very limited development of inter-Caribbean connections. So I went back to that period to see, okay, when it would be most logical that these connections were established or there was an outreach, uh, what happened then? And from there, I looked at the self-image of, of the Dutch Caribbean so that was the background to, to my interest. And in answering your question, what about this neglect? So it's, it's very multifaceted. And I only took that part of the sort of problem. Um, maybe there's no problem. And as I stated in my introduction of the article, I did that because I consider that part of our Caribbean intellectual history. These roots, these manifestations are part of that wider story. It's about connecting to Eric Williams, connecting to whoever took up that role in, in these days. I agree. One other thing that I do definitely want to not just make a nod to is language as well, right? You know, as formally or, you know, some of them are still Dutch islands. It's complicated, which we will talk a bit more um, later yes. on in the episode, but you have Dutch speaking peoples. Um, obviously, Papiamento is another dominant language on some of the islands as well. And so I think that adds, you know, to further your point, another layer of the sort of complications um, as to why we have these sort of different sects in when thinking of the Caribbean. It definitely becomes a sort of language differential when it comes to grouping. That's an excellent point because 
Papiamento on, on the Leeward Islands. I always mix them up in English, but a Curaçao, Aruba, Bonaire have Papiamento as dominant language. And Dutch is still the, the language of former colonizer, and it's English on the other three islands. So Dutch is, in a sense, both a minority language and a formal language, and that's very complicated. So that sort of translates for a historian lots and lots of silences in the archives you have to deal with. So, yes, from the perspective of, for instance, an English-speaking or French or Spanish-speaking historian who wants to involve Dutch Caribbean may think, okay, I don't speak Dutch. How could I ever read all these archive materials? Yes, that's a good point. But even if you could, you still miss out so much of this history because you only have these materials. That brings me to sort of demographics question, right? Especially depending on which island you're talking about, which is not different from anywhere else in the Caribbean, right? A number of them have gone through various sort of colonial hands. I don't like that, but, (laughs) you know, understanding that they might have been originally Spanish colonies and English colonies and Dutch colonies, you know, for all of them, it's varied. But A, could you talk about what the demographics sort of look like and obviously how that has affected languages? Like, I'm not sure how many people even know of Papiamento unless you're from the Caribbean. Yeah, that's pity. Because Papiamento, it's not just a Creole language. And my vocabulary may not be the ones exactly the language linguists would use, but other Creole languages have uh, developed as the language of the oppressed and very often were forbidden or whatever. And Papiamento is, is developed through all classes. Uh, so it's, it's in African influences, uh, Spanish and Portuguese influences from the Jewish merchants and slave traders and owners. And then there's Dutch and then there's English and there, then there's some French. Like we say, bon appetit when we start to eat. And, but it's just papimento, bon appetit. So there's little French in there. But the, the fact that this was truly a language for everyone spoken by everyone, a true connection between all races, all classes, is quite impressive, I think. Curaçao is the largest of the three islands. And it's known, I think, for it being a hub in the slave trade and also for the Jewish merchants. So what happened on Curaçao is when slavery ended in 1863, about 90% of the population was ever Curaçaoan. And the island was very limited in whatever it could do to survive in its sort of economic opportunities or value or whatever. So the population was kept alive. Some efforts were made to bring some development to the islands, which did not occur until the 1915 when the oil refinery came. And later on, on Aruba, also an oil refinery was established. And that brought a lot of development to the islands and, of course, also demographically. But what happened on Curaçao in particular, and and to me that's a very important part to understand uh, the Dutch Caribbean and in particular Curaçao, is that whatever happened afterwards with the new industry, with the Second World War and the booming of the oil industry, whatever happened, it was always the Afro-Curaçaoan, which is not the same as Black, but the Afro-Curaçaoan population at distance from opportunity. And that explains a lot even today in our society, that even though there was migration, lots of labor migration from the other islands for easy, flexible work, for instance, in the oil industry, all the Afro-Curaçaoans would have been hired. They would have formed a a block and they would have gained a lot of power. So there was a huge influx of people from Portugal, from the other islands, uh, Suriname as well, but at a higher level on the island. And just a side note, there was never plantation economy in any of these islands. So that makes us a bit different, uh, perhaps, for some historians who have been very focused on that plantation system and everything around that. So demographically, going back, Curaçao, you have all these migrants that enter society at higher levels, and then you have this large 
lower social economic group of the Africa Sound, uh, which make color and colorism very complicated on the islands and, and racism as well. Then Aruba had a, a much more Spanish influenced population, more people originally from the islands like the uh, Capitillo uh, Indians. And the same is true for Bonaire. On Curaçao, this group was shipped to Saint-Domingue uh, in the 17th century. Like you said, it's very mixed and we have lots of Latinos on all the islands, Aruba in particular. And when we go to the other islands in the, the Windward Islands, St. Martin, Stacia, and we say Stacia, it's sort of a nickname, sweet name, for, yeah, a nickname for uh, St. Stacia's. And Seba, they have uh, suffered in a sense from lots of migration out of their islands. Uh, so, for instance, I recently read that when sugar was booming in, in Santo Domingo, 1500s, young men from St. Martin went to work there. And that was about half of the, the labor population. So these islands are, have always been very vulnerable and very, like you said, moving around. And also to the Netherlands, from all six islands, whenever you had slightly above average primary education and, and talent or the right amount of, you know, right class and money for further education, you would mostly go to the Netherlands, except for the Jewish population that a tendency to send their kids to the U.S. Jewish population in particular is very interesting, I think, from the Dutch Caribbean, because lots of families in the Caribbean originate from the first time Jewish families that established themselves on the islands in the 17th century. Thank you for that, first of all. I think I did want to just sort of follow up with that and saying you made a sort of distinction between afro curacao and, and black and so i just wanted to clarify for the most part are the afro curacaoans mixed race but maybe they identify as predominantly black is that how that sort of works the thing is that even if you've been born or your your second generation third generation say surinamese on the island you're you're still surinamese and that has to do with the pain of having people from Suriname with a darker skin color moving into society as migrants on a higher level. And that was because Suriname's education was mm -hmm. Protestant. Here, the Catholic Church was uh, given the care for education and, and health care. But in Suriname, it, it was Dutch. So the Surinamese culture is much more an education Dutch-based. And the, the level of the language proficiency was much higher. So the Surinamese got all the, the better jobs in the refinery and in education that were not open for the local people. So there was this ongoing thing of, well, are Afro-Curacaoans, Pueblo, or Yubi Corsao population is not interested in that, or is not, this is not me mm -hmm. speaking, but that was the way the colonizers sort of uh, thought it's not for them. They're happy to be there doing their work in the fields. They're not interested in more education, blah, blah, blah. But that, that became a sort of a ongoing, uh, never ending sort of circle. And, and then with the people from the other islands that, uh, and from Suriname, with darker skin colors moving into society at a higher level, of course, cause a lot of jealousy and anger. It definitely is a complicated history, but I think due to movement, right, it definitely helps. And so one thing I definitely did want us to talk about today for our discussion is the movement for anti-colonialism in a way, right, which we'll get to is sort of not over, but I think especially in the history um, you see it ramping up between the late 19th century and early 20th century. And so could you talk with us through some of those important movements, you know, maybe people who spearheaded sort of those anti-colonial movements, whether they were in the region, like in the Dutch Caribbean, as well as maybe Dutch Caribbeans who were activists in the Netherlands as well? Well, up until the 1940s, and I'll come back to that later, it was just individuals and no movement. 
And one of the reasons, and I work through that in, in my article in Small Acts, is that individuals that spoke up really were punished severely for doing so. And I think it's small island culture. I think it's part of the way the colonization took place with the Catholic Church, that there is a lot of deep sense, a deep urge for sort of conformity on the island in the population. I need to be careful. I'm not a social psychologist or whatever. I'm just a historian. But I've written a lot about this conformity, this, maybe it's not a good word, complacency, conformity, not speaking up. So if people did, they were both by the colonizer, church or whoever, and by society itself punished for doing so. So we have had these heroes, if I, I may use that word, um, and I don't use that lightly. I don't like the word at all. In effect, why am I using it? I'm using it because some people like Medardo de Marchena, who spoke up in 1929, even today, he's still considered like a half lunatic. He was sent away to Bonaire. He was in prisons. He was treated so unfairly for just writing some pamphlet and speaking up. And even today, I spoke with his family. They still suffer from the impact of that. It's society doing that as well. That's what happened with the individuals. So there were individuals speaking up in a credible anti-colonial way, both in the Netherlands and here. And I think Anton de Kom is most famous uh, from Suriname. And I have the very good news that there will finally be an English publication of Beislaven from Suriname is a grand addition to anti-colonial literature in the Caribbean. Very happy for that. I think his story is very interesting, even in thinking about our diaspora, given that his article, Starvation, Misery and Terror in Dutch Guyana, were you know translated and circulated in the U.S. in large part due to Otto and Hermina Hiswad, who I've also spoken about on this podcast, two very fervent communists in Harlem. And that goes into a whole nother story. One thing of mine is always to point to those connections. We could definitely go off and name a bunch of dissimilarities. There are still a number of ways that we've still worked together. Uh, indeed, this connection to the Communist Party. And I was doing some research on Dutch, Spanish, Caribbean interrelations and interactions. And you see that, especially in the more leftish, socialist, unionist, communist part of the spectrum, that the critical people in the Dutch Caribbean, they all left. And they all have these connections. And you see them again in, in Santo Domingo. You see them in New York. I hope to be writing on that more in the, in the future. It says so much about the atmosphere in the Dutch colonies. And what I find fascinating is that the Dutch Caribbean itself, even today, in, in all the literature, in the histories that have been written, doesn't seem to connect to these sources. So I kept wondering what then is and was the self-image and how did this self-image connect to being neglected? Because there is this disconnect which seems to perpetuate itself, which mm -hmm. may start from the Dutch Caribbean instead of being something that they are, are the victim of. Uh, what happens is that in the Second World War, the Dutch Caribbean had to govern itself at a distance from the Netherlands, obviously, because the com communication would, was cut, cut up through the war. And at the same time, economies were booming in the Netherlands, uh, Antilles, or for the Dutch Caribbean uh, islands in particular. Lots of opportunities arose. And the key person there was the nationalist leader, Moises da Costa Gomez, who was a politician for the Catholic People's Party, but he started an underground movement, and the word underground was taken indeed from the Underground Railroad. So there was this awareness of everything that, that went on in the U.S. already, which you, you never saw any traces of that awareness until that moment. So the opportunity arose throughout the Second World War to feel empowered and to act towards autonomy in the islands themselves. So, of course, things happened in the Netherlands as well. 
with the Queen saying we need to rethink our connection to uh, our colonies and there were round table conferences so things happened there and that's all very well documented but there was this movement as well on the islands which was indeed a movement of nationalism and, and of course it was anti-colonialism in there as well that started in 1946 with also the new political parties being formed 1948 uh, universal suffrage 1949 first elections landslide victory for the nationalist party so that's where you really saw a movement up until that point. And that was the, the frustration of uh, Medo de Marchena in 1929. He said, but we are a block. We are so many. There are so many of us oppressed. So even by forming a group, we can move things. But that never, ever happened. And I think you're getting to... What I was definitely hoping we talk about today, that once you get to the 70s, Suriname becomes excluded because they gain independence in 75. But what you're sort of talking about brings about the Netherlands and Tillys, which in a way, I think sort of my point to sort of analogous to what the West Indian Federation was trying to do a bit. So could you talk a bit about how the Netherlands and Tillys function starting in I think it's 1954, and what eventually led to its dissolution? Yeah. Well, first of all, I stand corrected that I, when I spoke about individuals and movements, I focused on the Dutch Caribbean mm. uh, without Suriname. Uh, for Suriname, and if I may add that, uh, because the picture would not be complete without it, but there was the student movement from Amsterdam that was critical. So there was a movement before the 40s, but that started in the diaspora and not in the areas itself. So there is a definite link or a very clear link with the repercussions in the islands and in Suriname. And then moving to your question of Suriname in the 1970s and the Netherlands and Tilly's uh, 1954, you made that link to the West Indian Federation. The interesting thing, I think, of how the autonomy was shaped as a non-sovereignty in the 1930s already by the, the works of Buispol and Da Costa Gomez. And these Buispol was a lawyer from Suriname and Da Costa Gomez was a lawyer from the Dutch Caribbean. And both thought about a future with more autonomy within the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And that sort of came so natural. It was never really part of a fierce discussion or anything. We don't want to be on our own, but we do want to get the room for, you know, taking care of the things that we can take care of within the islands. That happened in the in the 30s and 40s and with eventually leading to so what what I mean by that happened, the round tables took place in the 40s and all the discussions and the legal preparations, etc. And that happened also with Indonesia on board at first. But then Indonesia decided to leave the ship. And, and uh, that was a hard blow for the Netherlands, who would not have cared too much if the Caribbean islands would have, you know, say uh, goodbye. But they didn't say goodbye. They said, no, we, we don't want to leave. We want to stay, but on our own terms. So that was quite a surprise. But eventually, 1945, two countries within the Kingdom of the Netherlands were established. Suriname as a country within uh, the kingdom and the Netherlands Antilles with comprising of these six islands as the Netherlands Antilles. And indeed, not much seemed to happen until the early 70s when uh, right after what happened in May 69, the revolt taking place in Curaçao was a moment for the Dutch government of sort of awakening to, okay, we've, this is taking too long and now we need, really need to put independence on the agenda. Again, the Dutch Caribbean said, why? The kingdom is okay for us. But it was some people in Suriname, and that's part of history, there's a lot of discussion points there, whether it was just opportunity driven by a smaller group or truly a democratic sort of wish of Suriname. But whatever happened, happened. 
uh, eventually in 1975, Suriname was fully independent from the Netherlands. Then in 86, Aruba also became a separate country within the kingdom of the Netherlands. So could you talk a bit about how this works? So now there's eventually this dissolution of the Netherlands Antilles that occurs making Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin part of the kingdom as what is called constituent countries. And then the other islands, Seba, Bonaire, and St. Eustace become municipalities. And so what are the differences in how those different positions function? And, you know, is there like an equal and free movement between the countries, the territories, and obviously the metropole of the Netherlands? There's a lot that can be said about that. First of all, Aruba already got that status in 86, and then Curaçao and St. Martin got that status in 2010 based on uh, a referendum. So it was smaller islands that sort of democratic decided that they wanted to be municipality and other options were also put on the table then and the consequences of course have been anticipated but still we're now 11 years in this new situation there are still major challenges one is the level of care within the municipalities that they now like the French islands, for instance, the money that you get when you don't have a job, things like social security things and, and education, they can claim the same level as other municipalities in the kingdom. But obviously that would lead to uh, lots of other problems because all the people without jobs in Curaçao would move to Bonaire to, you know, to live on that, that high standard. So that's just a, a very simple uh, example of, of one of the challenges. And then my second to last question is when I think of Caribbean cooperation, beyond just, you know, specifically the Dutch Caribbean, I may think of the fact that like Aruba and the other countries, they're observers of CARICOM, or the one that comes to mind is first Prime Minister Eric Williams' visit to Aruba and Curacao in 63. So my question then is, in what ways, you know, have you seen regional cooperation manifest? You know, what have been the good, the bad? Um, what has worked? What maybe hasn't worked so well? I've seen little interactions that is in the archives that are there and the connections that are there. So, yes, Air Williams was here. He gave his speech. There were visits and there was an increase of visits from Dutch delegations on the islands. But I looked at intellectuals uh, mostly. So now, for instance, that I'm looking at the trade relationships with Santo Domingo, it, it's a whole different sort of perspective and you get all sorts of interactions. But I was looking specifically at these sort of cultural reach out. The, the platforms that develop in the Caribbean, such as the Caribbean organization, these have been studied mostly through a more traditional lens, looking at the impact. For me, it, when I started looking at these collections in the archives, and that, that made me realize, okay, I see, for instance, a Shaki de Brot here. Shaki de Brot was a politician uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Among that first generation of post-autonomy politicians. And so as our very final question, the music and literature lover in me has to ask, um, what are some of your favorite examples of Dutch Caribbean history in popular culture? In popular culture. Mirada, like in Spanish, in Caribe with a K. If you look that up on YouTube, you'll find the work of Sheralia Emanuelson, an artist. I'm working with her as a researcher on the comeback scene and the comeback scene is the musical scene that developed here on the islands from people who went to Cuba to work in Schubert there and they came back to Curaçao and they sort of developed this this uh, you could say idealization but it was in own form of Cuban music and so you had the conjuntos here and the parties and the, the thing is, these are parties that you 
could only visit if you were invited. And this was very much of a sort of subculture with a very high uh, orientation grade. So lots of things going on there that, that you will not find easily if you don't know the island. It was sort of half underground, Mira de Caribe. But musically, I think it, you, you would love to see the influences and that's back and forth. I think one of the, um, the things that really needs research is how the Ellen Lomax connection of, of rhythms and music in the Caribbean connects to, for instance, migrants coming from the Dutch Caribbean to and from and, and all these uh, influences. So that's one. And second, I, I love naive, uh, I, I don't like the word, but the naive paintings of the 50, 40s and 50s. And in particular, I, I recently discovered the work of Miss Lee, Miss Lee Hodge. She was born in St. Martin. She was sent to New York because she was in love with someone she was not supposed to be in love with. And then she eventually, she returned to Curacao, where she was living her life very independently. And if you look at, at her paintings, you see a little bit of everything. And it's so Caribbean and yet so Dutch Caribbean at the same time. But the wording, for instance, she uses words in her work as well. That's still English because of her St. Martin background. So yeah, I, I love that. Beautiful. It also has New York in it as well. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Yeah. So that's Miss Lee. I wanted to share Miss Lee with you. Oyago. Stay tuned for Strictly Back Sounds, where we connect our history to pop culture. We have to give a big shout out to Dr. Grenwad's musical and artistic suggestions. To add literature to the mix, of course, check out pharmacist, politician, and writer Corel de Hassett's novel, Slave and Master, that stages the 1795 slave revolt in Curacao, as well as poet and novelist Frank Martinez Arion's novel, Double Play, which in true Caribbean form, follows four men playing a marathon game of dominoes at the height of colonial unrest in Curacao. And for additional fun facts, the former was originally written in Papiamento, highlighting the importance of writing our works in our languages. And the latter, Double Play, was recently adapted into a film by the same name in 2017. Check out these links to our culture on the syllabus now. Well, you've heard it first, Strictly Facts fam. I will put the links to all of the references, the number of readings and things that Dr. Grenwad has so graciously shared with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Grenwad, for, you know, being with us on Strictly Facts and sharing so much of this Dutch Caribbean history with us. As always, listeners, thank you for listening. And links to Dr. Grenwad's work will be in the show notes. And we hope you enjoyed this episode. Little more. Thanks for tuning in to Strictly Facts. Visit strictlyfactspodcast.com for more information from each episode. Follow us at Strictly Facts Pod on Instagram and Facebook and at Strictly Facts PD on Twitter.